Buenos días. Good morning. The organizers of this uh, commemorative uh, congress celebrating the 50th years of the founding of Fontes, a better way of closing this event by inviting Lyle Campbell. Introducing Lyle Campbell is an honor for me but and a pleasure as well, although it's not an easy task, especially if you consider how broad and how major his work is and the contributions that he's made. I'm not exaggerating if I say that he is the author of the Manual for Historical and Comparative Linguistics, which has been most used in universities around the world. It was first published in 1998. I think it's now on its fourth or fifth issue. It's been uh, translated into several languages, including Chinese. Historical and comparative linguistics is fashionable after several years in which it was just just avoided and uh, suspect. And this may think make us think that perhaps that's the reason for the success of his uh, book. But we could actually think completely the opposite. The fact that uh, the book is so good, and that has increased the uh, prestige of this kind of study, because the success of this book is not something that's happened by a pure chance. And you can't say about this book, as Michelena did say about another book, uh, that it was written by an author who'd, who'd learned everything through books, but actually it's completely the opposite, because this is the view of an experienced uh, linguist who's studied and compared many languages and many families of languages around the world. If traditionally uh, the uh, subject is the natural field for Indo-European experts and Campbell has used, however, his uh, weapons, as it were, in other fields following the tradition of his country, which includes several authors well-known, such as uh, Blumfeld. And he, he's looked at Mayan languages, not just language, but different forms of writing, South American languages, Aztec languages. And this has given him direct first-hand languages of several families of languages in America, which is meant gave him the possibility of writing in 1997 a book entitled American Indian Languages, for which he won the Bloomfield Prize. But not just for American language, but he also knows uh, Finnish and several Ural, Uralic languages. He's taught at several universities. He's even traveled to New Zealand. And when he was in New Zealand, he became interested in Maori. He then returned to Utah, where he became a director of the uh, Amer Indian uh, language Institute, and he's now in Hawaii University. He uh, retired two years ago, but that hasn't stopped him from working. He's a very active in his job. In fact, he's increased his work, and since he retired, he's published two books, including Language Isolates and others which are about to be printed. So all of his teaching activity, all his field work has made his reflections on language comparison and methods very sound about the meth the limits he's dealt with the distant uh, relations, distant relations between languages. He's looked quite closely into that. But uh, the, other, uh, the other side of that is he's actually been in, shown a great deal of interest in language isolates and dealt with eternal uh, problems of comparative her historical linguistics, for example, the comparison between aerial linguistics, population, genetics, 
He's uh, written about typology and the theory of grammaticalization. Another book he wrote about that, which was also uh, received a Bloomfield Prize, written together with another author, and on this occasion on syntax. And to finalize, recently he's I think I've heard him say he's interested in something that he feels is the most important thing for linguists today, which is the description and safeguarding of languages under threat of extinction in the world today. He's drawn up a catalogue. I should imagine it's about to be published if it's not already in print. So I should just like to say thank you to Lyle Campbell on behalf of the organizers for the generosity that he's shown in accepting this invitation. He's come from the other corner of the world to celebrate with us the anniversary of the founding of Fontes. So welcome and thank you. Whenever I listen to these kind of introductions, I, I always end up thinking, who are they talking about? I should like to firstly thank the organizers for inviting me to take part in this event and for giving me the possibility of uh, coming to Pamplona once again and to see my friends from the Basque Country too. Just one thing before I, I start. There's a lot of information in this talk, and I can't deal with all of it. So there are lists of things that I'm going to have to skip. So if you're interested, just send me an email, and I will return the presentation to you with the bibliography and everything. It may well be uh, worthwhile being a little patient with the Spanish that I've used in it, but I've, I've written it myself. So it's truly a privilege to be invited to talk at this event, uh, which is um, You've organized to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, Fontes Lingue Vasconum. Having said that, I see a little bit out of place because my role when I talk about this uh, journal has always been as a recipi recipient. I've, I'm somebody that's benefited from it. Not, I'm not somebody that has his own ideas to offer, to contribute. I've learned so much from prominent authors that have published at, in the magazine, including, of course, Coldo Michelena, Antonio Tovar, Josep Antonio Lacara, and many others, including an article published by Hugo Schuchart. And I've learned an awful lot as well from articles that have appeared in the journal and that deal with subjects that I'm very much interested in, uh, subjects such as Aquitaine, language contact, distant linguistic kinship, and many other subjects as well. So that's why I'm always asking myself, what can I say at this event? Well, in the end, I decided the subject that I wanted to deal upon because I remember that back in the International Linguist Congress in 2003, I was asked to give a talk and also head up a workshop about the current state of historical linguistics. And as the situation of historical linguistics has changed so much in the 16 years that have gone by since 2003, it's perhaps worthwhile to go back and take a fresh look at it and see what the current situation of uh, historical linguistics is. So, 
The subject of this Congress, which is new methods and uh, trends in Basque linguistics, the purpose of my talk is going to be to take a look once again at recent developments and the most active subject areas in current historical linguistics. And I hope that you actually draw something from it, learn something from it. And uh, what about the vitality of historical linguistics? Some people thought back in 2003 and still think today that historical linguistics is actually losing vitality, that there's not so much activity, that it's underrepresented in congresses in general, in linguistic uh, journals, and in the syllabus of many linguistics departments. And yet, there is evidence to show that there's an increase in the activity and the vitality of historical linguistics since 2003. For example, there are congresses on historical linguistic subjects, and many books have been published on historical linguistics in recent years. For example, some of them have even won prizes. For example, eight of the 19 uh, uh, winners of the Bloomfield Prize of the American Linguistics Association have uh, gone to uh, books that deal with subjects related to historical linguistics. Also, new journals have appeared in uh, these recent years. You've got the Journal of Historical Linguistics, the Journal of Language Evolution, Language Dynamics and Change, Journal of Language Contact, and many other journals. There are also new publication series. For example, the Oxford Studies in Diachronic and Historical Linguistics, and Brill Studies in Historical Linguistics. And also handbooks have appeared. One which was written by Bowen and Bethwin Evans is the Routledge Handbook of Historical Linguistics. And then you've got the Handbook of Historical Linguistics published by Joseph and Chanda. And there are also new textbooks. To teach historical linguistics. For example, this one. One written by my colleague Robert Blast, 101 Problems and Solutions in Historical Linguistics. And there are new issues, reissues of new historical linguistics textbooks. And there are all different kinds of manuals on different subjects or areas, thematic areas of historical linguistics, for example. Some are on language families, specific language families, or specific languages, such as languages in the Indo-European family, the history of English, on language contact, on language isolates, corpus, linguistics, and many others. And also a whole series of etymological dictionaries have popped up on languages and language families, including Basque. What's more, there are new institutes that study historical linguistics. We've got the Angus McIntosh Center for Historical Linguistics in Scotland, the Department of uh, Linguistic Evolu Linguistic and Cultural Evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Historical Human Science and the ARC Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. And since 2003, according to Linguist List, 121 PhD dissertations have been published on historical linguistics. I think there are actually more than that. But I'm hoping that all the authors have been successful after publishing their 
doctoral thesis. So perhaps we can conclude that the health of uh, historical linguistics is, um, is good, perhaps uh, even stronger than 16 years ago, back in 2003. And I'd like to mention, however, a problem. And it's the problem of general science journals, annals such as Nature, Science, Scientific American, etc., because they're very prestigious journals in several fields, but what the, a publisher about uh, linguistics is usually complete rubbish. They publish articles which are very, very wrong, and they don't subject to, men, to any sort of professional assessment that they would expect from articles published in subjects in their own fields. And not only that, the statements that are made in these articles don't only appear in these journals, but they reach the general media and they're disseminated. And in fact, linguistics and historical linguistics in general is very, very badly or ill underrepresented by what is published in these uh, journals. And yet a lot is being published about historical linguistics in recent years. Just to give you some examples of that. For example, the so-called relationship between Basque and Indo-European statements about the proto-world or about Amerindian by Greenberg, according to Greenberg, Oh, sorry, Caleb Everett said that uh, people who live in high mountain areas tend to use glottalized consonants, uh, whereas damp climates encourage tonal languages and dry climates discourage tonal contrast. There's a lot of evidence that these statements are actually <laughs> baseless, rubbish. They're just invalid. As Kiparski said, we'd happily change, and I'm talking here about magazines such as Science and Nature, but as Kiparski said when he spoke about these uh, uh, journals, we'd uh, happily change some of your uh, clumsy uh, graphs for more convincing arguments. Anyway, let's look now at those areas where there's currently a lot of activity, and there are a lot of them. I'm just going to mention some of them. There are, for example, aerial linguistics, phonological change, syntactic change, language contact, grammaticalization, mixed languages, a corpus. Uh, and there are many, many subjects that are being studied. There's a lot of activity in uh, these subject areas within historical linguistics. As I said, I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'm just going to mention some of them, just a few of them. Make my personal choice. I'll, I'll give some details about them. The first of this is the explanation of phonological change or phonetical change. There's a lot of work in this field, and I'm not going to say a great deal about it. Perhaps just I should say that there's a lot of work in this field. And that's good, because new things are being explained. This book, which was uh, edited by Alan Yu, is entitled Origins of Sound Change, Approaches to Phonologization. And other subjects, for example, there's interest in how many language families there are in the world. Linguists don't know or didn't know how many language families there are. The maximum number of uh, language uh, families in the world is really the set of independent families, and that includes language isolates, that cannot be proven to be related to any other language family. And if you use that to calculate it, then the number of language families in the world is around 407. 
can be fearful. And there, there uh, you can see some sources uh, uh, related to who says that. All of the languages that used to belong to 96 of these uh, 407 uh, families are already extinct. So, if there are only 407 in the world and only 100 have already disappeared, that means that nobody speaks them today, that there are no, none of those languages being spoken by anybody. This is tragic. And what that means is almost a quarter of language diversity of this world, if you calculate that in terms of language families, has actually disappeared forever. And that's why we're so concerned about languages in danger of extinction. And the total number of language isolates in the world is around 159. And Basque is the most well-known of these. Language isolates represent almost 40% of these uh, language families that exist in the world. And that's important because many people believe that there are very few language isolates, but that's not true. I mean, there are some languages that only have a one member within this language isolate. From this uh, perspective, language isolates actually aren't rare. In fact, they have other colleagues. And other, other colleagues of these language isolates represent over a third of all the language families in the world. This is a book about language isolates that we published last year. I uh, edited, and there's an article about Basque in this book, by the way, written by Prof Professor Josep Lacarra. Another subject that's very um, popular these days, which is the uh, hypothesis of a distant kinship. And this debate about macro families has concentrated and has improved, in fact, the methods of how we research, how we look into possible relationships between languages when it's not known whether they are related or not. A lot of um, progress has been made there, but despite the progress in understanding the criteria and methods to research uh, possible distant relationships, and despite the fact that so many proposals have been rejected, people are still proposing new cases, which unfortunately haven't been very successful. Here's another book that we published together with myself and William Posa, basically on that subject, which is an attempt to prove how languages are related and how you go about proving that they're related and whether it's a distant relationship or not. There have been many cases of hypotheses of a distant uh, kinship, and some have come to people's attention. There's been speculative efforts at trying to unite known uh, language families into m larger macro families. But and that, and that, those efforts are continuing, and I'm just making, mentioning some of them there. You've got the Ostrico, which is Austronesian plus Austro-Asian. There's even this attempt with Basque. You can see it on the list there, Basque were linked to Indo-European. So there are many, many, many hypotheses regarding distant relationship. And, and there's also a very promising hypothesis put forward by Terence Kaufman that Tartesian is actually a member of the Celtic language family. 
I don't know anything about Tartesian nor about Celtic languages, but actually I read the book and I think it was quite plausible, a very attractive theory. So I'm just waiting to hear from the experts to hear what they say. I imagine it will be hotly debated. And then there's the case of this hypothesis that Basque and Indo-European languages are, are some way related. A lot has been said about that. And Juliette Blevin's book has been mentioned a great deal, a book that was published last year. I'm going to say a bit more about this. There are certain problems, I have to admit, in Blevins's book, and we saw that uh, when we listened to what Joaquin had to say on the first day, I, 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 there's this uh, word, semantic lumping, that I've written down in Spanish. I don't know how to pronounce it. And people have criticized almost everything that's written. And uh, there are a lot of criticisms of this book. But I just want to mention one field of critics, which is the semantic field, because she talks about uh, semantic lumping that I mentioned earlier. But it, and in her words, that I've translated into Spanish, she talks about the weakening of standard semantic identity as a requirement. So she's comparing things from Basque with Indo-European languages, which semantically are really very unconvincing. And there's some examples of them. She compares words from Basques, from Basque with Indo-European words. And in this case, about the Basque word, to uh, eye or to look at. She compares that with a, a European a word which means joyful or vigorous or animated. I mean, I don't see where the connection there is, and it may well be that there's a, some kind of a phonetical uh, similarity between the Basque word and the Proto-Indo-European word, but it this uh, phonetical similarity may just be pure accidental. And then you've got the Basque word, um, wild or uncultivated, which she compares with the Proto-Indo-European word for naked. But there are criticisms there. I need to point that out. If, if comparisons are very different semantically, it's very possible that it's just pure chance, pure accident that explains the phonetical similarity in these cases. What's the outlook for, or the, what's the possibility of discovering reliable uh, relationships between language families, even between language isolates that have got, gone unknown until today? Here I've got a, a list of several cases that were hypotheses, but today have uh, widely been accepted as uh, checked and certain. Some of them are very unknown. For example, Lule Vilela, a South American language, now is known that it uh, belongs to a language family and is now no longer a language isolate. And there are several cases like that. And here I've ad ad added uh, as a possibility the possibility of there being this relationship between Tartesian in the Celtic family of languages. It's a question mark after it. And another issue is aerial linguistics. There's a lot of work being done in this field. 
A linguistic area or Sprachbund is actually a geographical area where, thanks to language contact, uh, the languages of the region share structural features. Here you can see one written by Matras, McMahon and Vincent called Linguistic Areas, and also a handbook of aerial linguistics by Hickey. I've calculated that a lot has been published in recent years about aerial linguistics. And in fact, 79 different uh, language areas in the world have been proposed. There's probably more. Those are the ones that I've uh, found. A lot. You can see the lists and lists that I'm projecting. So if you want to write to me, I'll send you this presentation so you can look into these different uh, proposed language areas of the world. I'm going to skip this part. Because it, it's a very debated subject. Even the definition of what a language or linguistic area is has uh, been hotly debated. I've also mentioned that there are several studies that mentioned Basque as within the context of aerial linguistics. Sorry, I apologize. There's been a hiccup with my presentation. I do apologize, just be patient. That's why I detest technology. This is the sort of thing that needs to happen when you're at home, when you're practicing, not when you're doing a live presentation. I'm hoping that I won't get this same problem again. As I said earlier, many people have uh, spoken about uh, Basque uh, when referring to aerial linguistics and uh, its comparison with uh, neighboring languages. And then there's another subject which is very popular at the moment, which is uh, genetical linguistic correlations. The, does a linguistic heritage has to how does it have to coincide with a biological heritage? Does it have to be a genetic link as well? I is there a parallel evolution between language and genes? Uh, for geneticists, the null hypothesis is that there, there will be no contact between languages. There won't be much uh, language uh, word loans, nor will there be an exchange of genes. 
that's the null hypothesis when there's no linguistic mix and no genetic mix. But the null hypothesis of those with a linguistic mix and mixing and genetic mixing, then languages come into contact. And loan words are taken as well from each language. At the same time, populations, of course, exchange their genes. So there's a huge difference between the way linguists see things in this, question, in this matter and the way geneticists see it. And language replacement, replacement is very common amongst populations that see, still exist, but that speak another language. That is, populations still exist, but they, they've lost their language. And this is a problem for those who believe that populations still always have the same historical lineage and that they have their own language. Here we come to the part that I don't enjoy so much. In recent years, there's been a great deal of work and studies that use methods taken from evolutionary biology and have used these methods to apply them to classified languages. And if you want a list of many, many studies of this kind, you just need to visit this website that's up on the screen. These new um, approaches would be welcomed if they could help us solve uncertainties, if they could contribute using more efficient methods or could provide new discoveries, help correlate findings from other subject areas with linguistic facts, or even if they gave linguistics a, an increasing credibility from the viewpoint of academics of other uh, subject areas, although that shouldn't be necessary. Computational applications can increase the ability to research huge quantities of historical data, which otherwise would be impossible. You just couldn't analyze them without the assistance of computers. So that computers are great for analyzing huge amounts of data. New approaches, perhaps, will give us visual means that are more uh, clarifying to represent uh, relationships or kinship together with language changes that have come about through loan words, as has been promised by the analysis of NeighborNet and uh, Bayes' analysis. Historical linguistics and evolutionary biology have shared interests, of course. However, linguistic change and biological evolution are different in fundamental ways. The traditional methods used by historical linguistics use a broad range of linguistic data, whilst many quantitative approaches just use lexical data, for example, basic vocabulary. Diffusion or is a horizontal transfer between languages has generally been studied very, very little in the majority of these quantitative approaches, but it's always been very important in traditional linguistics. Reactions to the application of new techniques that have been brought from biology have been, of course, uh, varied. Some people show great enthusiasm and some others are very hostile. Many historical linguistics think that those who apply new methods actually don't know how complex languages are or how complex 
linguistic changes, applying techniques uh, developed in evolutionary biology to language classifications is there's no doubt about it, inappropriate because there are major differences between languages and biological species and how each changes. Languages undergo many types of changes that don't affect biological species, changes that don't have a biological basis to them, but are actually motivated by a whole series of different factors, such as social factors, cog cognitive factors, political factors, etc., cultural. The mo those models that have been taken on board uh, and taken from biology don't actually consider many aspects of uh, linguistic change which are known to be important to be able to understand and explain linguistic change, things such as, and here I'm going to list, analogical changes, directionality of change, reanalysis, grammaticalization, semantic changes, neologisms, everything that we do, that we historical linguists do, because we know that these are important facts if we're trying to explain linguistic change. And if, uh, if you just concentrate on lexicon, on words, you lose all of this. And that's why we know that a lot is being lost by not paying attention to these issues that are necessary, need to be considered if we're talking about linguistic change. The majority of approaches based on phylogenetic methods in biology don't, aren't concerned about the problem of loan words because they only work with cognates, cognates that have already been established by linguists. And they presuppose that linguists have already eliminated the loan words. So linguists have the feeling that these quantitative methods that depend on an initial identification of cognates by the linguist requires the application of a standard standardized linguistic methods to do the donkey work of establishing cognates, eliminating loan words, and deal with many other uh, complicated uh, factors before the data can be used by quantitative methods. So just dealing with cognate-based data that linguists work requires doesn't consider what historical linguists have to do to establish these cognates. And what do we have to do? Well, there's the list. We have to find sound changes. We have to know change directionality. We have to discover shared innovations. We have to recognize plausible semantic changes, recognize sound, loans, loan words and eliminate things that are due to, that have changed due to analogical changes and many things that have to be done for cognates to become useful for these kind of quantitative studies. So it's pro quite probable that many historical uh, linguistics, it's, it's hardly surprising that they're still skeptical regarding attempts to use these kind of methods to try to find and assess phylogenetic trees or to establish subgroups and other things that they try to do that I've written on the screen. However, there are others that are still hopeful that these techniques can be refined to be able to better contribute to research into historical linguistics. People are beginning to experiment by not just uh, using lexicons, but also other kinds of data. And that's actually 
just a brief review of important issues in current historical linguistics. To conclude, historical linguistics vitality has actually increased and is far stronger now than it was 16 years ago in 2003. Much work has been done, different kinds of work in different areas and subjects. Much of the work being done today is excellent and some very valuable discoveries and developments have been made only very recently. Not all the areas where there's a great deal of activity have actually necessarily contribute with these valid contributions. But we can be optimistic about the future of historical linguistics. And I'm sure that Fontes Linguae Vasconum will carry on publishing studies and articles that contribute to valuable subjects in historical linguistics. And with that, I just like to say thank you. Here you've got my uh, email address if you want to ask for the presentation. Thank you so much, Lyle Campbell, for this extraordinary talk uh, with some many data. Uh, many comments and also for having shown such optimism because you have been very optimistic in virtually everything that you've said. There's perhaps some um, less uh, optimism, but maybe we should uh, look more closely at Tartesian and Celtic. I ne don't necessarily agree with what's being said there, but we've got about five minutes or less. If you've got any questions, anybody out there in the audience that have a question, please ask it now. If you use a microphone, we can more than happily interpret. Make it a question, Azcona, because I know what you're like. Sorry. Bien, vale. Quiere decir que la lengua, que la lengua es eh, una convención, no es algo que se transmite genéticamente. Any further questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk. And now we're going to actually move on to the closing ceremony of this event, which is going to be done by the authorities. Thank you.